स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Hello everyone this is Dr Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing we were discussing about the living organisms and as far as uh, what we have discussed so far we have discussed in the module 1 about the classification of the different organisms we have discussed what is the basis of the classification and then in detail we have discussed about the animal classification as well as the plant classifications based on these classifications we have understood that most of these organisms are being developed from the uh, previous organisms and we have seen that many uh, uh, how the these uh, lower invertebrates or how the uh, unicellular organisms are grown into the higher animals then in the previous lecture we have discussed in detail about their life and how the life was originated on to the earth so in that context we have discussed about the many uh, theories which were explaining the uh, origin of life on to the earth we have discussed about the uh, theory of special creations we discussed about the theory of spontaneous generations which actually believes that the non living matters are giving rise to the different types of organisms but that uh, theory was uh, incomplete because uh, it has not been based on the experimental evidences so uh, and there were uh, cr critical experiment which are been performed by the reddy spinelli or the louis pasteur to disprove that this is actually happening in the uh, current environment and then later on there were many, many other theories like the theory of catastrophism theory of cosmozoic theory of eternity of life and ultimately the, the there we have also discussed about the theory or modern theory or the chemical theory of uh, the uh, origin of life and chemical theory was the first theory which was based on the experimental evidences where the stanne miller and ure has done the very meticulously and very systematic experiment to prove that if you take the bio if you take the inorganic substances and if you uh, you know if you run them under the uh, primitive earth conditions which was reducing in nature then you could be able to develop the biomolecules and that was the first evidence that the life could be originated from in the in primitive environment because of the chemical interactions or the from the inorganic molecules and then they have actually proposed the event of the experiments how the different event could have happened onto the primitive earth and that's how they have said that ultimately the you know the inorganic substances are going to react with each other to give you the simple molecules which they have actually demonstrated by their uh, classical experiments and then they have said that these simple molecules are going to react with each other to give you the complex molecules these complex molecules will then aggregate and give you the coarser weights and the coarser weights are actually are the you know the they will develop the tendency of a living organisms if you recall we have discussed that what is the living organism living organism in the organism which could be able to run its metabolism which could be able to produce the energy and which could be able to repair and that was all the properties were present in the coarser weights but ultimately the coarser weights have started you know acquiring the biomolecules from the primordial oceans and then the it has actually acquired the nucleic acids and proteins and lipids and ultimately the coarser weights were developed into the first cell and that there, there's a you know complete breakage or the, there is no there is a gap what 
will explain that how the coservates are developed into the first cell which could be able to run its metabolism which could be able to draw the nutrition and so on and uh, one of the question which uh, they were you know we were to solve that why these things were not happening in the current environment and why the theory of spontaneous generation could not be able to be you know uh, successful because the current environment is the oxidizing in nature and because it is oxidizing in nature as soon as these inorganic substances are trying to react spontaneously trying to react with each other to give you the simple molecule they are actually uh, they are getting oxidized and because of that they are not been able to form the complex molecules uh, so uh, these are the things what we have discussed and we have discussed ultimately that the simple cell is being formed but as we know that the, that simple cell gradually being developed into the multicellular organisms and then the multicellular organisms develop into the higher class so the question in today's class what we are going to discuss is how and what is the mechanism of the these uh, simple primitive cells being uh, evolved into the multicellular organisms or the higher organisms so that uh, so as uh, what we have discussed we have discussed that the life is originated as the primitive cell with an ability to replicate absorb the nutrition and it can be able to repair the damages right although we are having a very very big gap uh, big gaps how the coservates are being developed into the primitive cell uh, but uh, that is uh, you know that is uh, we still probably the, you know have a no conclusive answer to that these single cells are the starting material to form the multicellular system and eventually the, to develop the organisms with the tissue and uh, organ systems uh, so the changes the progressive advancement of these uh, organism is by a process to acquire the uh, uh, the uh, traits so that it can be able to adapt to the new environment is known as the evolution and uh, aristotle uh, which was considered to be the father of biology uh, considered the evolution as the ladder of chain so where he or the scala nat naturally uh, involving the hierarchical linking of the series of the forms so what you have seen here is actually the ladder of chain where the uh, you know the organic matters are being placed at the bottom right so what you see here is the inorganic matters which are being placed at the bottom then the inorganic matters are being developed into the lower plants that lower plants are going to be developed into the higher plants and then these higher plants are being you know developed into the lower invertebrates like jellyfish and sponges and all that and then these jellyfishes are being developed into the insecta and uh, archivides then these uh, insects are being developed into the snails then snails are being developed into the crab and then crabs are being developed into the squids or octopus and then its octopus are being developed into the fishes then fishes are being developed into even the more advanced fishes and then the fishes are being developed into the reptiles and the reptiles are developed into the birds and uh, and then it, it will be developed into the mammals and ultimately it he has kept the humans on the top right this is this is simply the by not being based on the experiment these are all simply based on the observation as well as his own personal opinion that this could be the ladder of chain in which the organism are being evolved but the question comes what is the evidence that the evolution is really happening because uh, you know until unless we cannot have the experimental evidences we cannot have to you know, believe this particular type of you know scheme right we cannot say that lower animal lower plants are being developed first and the animals or the plant or humans are being developed at the later on right so uh, the chemical evolution so then people came up with the idea of chemical evolution the term evolution refer to the changes from the one form to another form and that form is always for the advancement so the change in living organism with the time to known as the organic or the biological evolutions the process of evolution can be understood from the fact that the uh, 
that the uh, uh, unicellular organisms appear uh, first, right? Unicellular organisms appear first. The simple multicellular organisms came later, and uh, later they were developed into the complex multicellular organisms such as the seed plants as well as the vertebrate animals. The fishes were the initial early vertebrates and it gradually changed to form the amphibians and so on. These amphibians have produced reptiles and uh, that evolved further to give the bird and the mammal. This hierarchical linking of different species is considered by as, as the ladder of chain by the Aristotle. And the same series, in the same series, the mammal have evolved to the human, evolving the ape-like primate by acquiring the changes over the course of time. So the chemical evolution or the normal evolution is actually the gradual a change in the animal forms or the organism form so that it can be able to acquire new and new traits, right? You might have seen the evolution is uh, either be very slow, right, where the monkey is being evolved into the humans or it could be very, very fast, right? Uh, you might have seen the adaptations in bacteria and, uh, you know, the, uh, the, how the, uh, you develop a single drug, right? Suppose you take a bacteria, right? For example, the mycobacterium tuberculosis, right? And if you treat it with a drug, the mycobacterium tuberculosis actually died, right? But in a due course, the mycobacterium tuberculosis actually do the, you know, changes, do, do the changes in its cellular body, right? And that's how it actually comes up with the multi drug resistance uh, MTB or drug resistance MTB, right? So, they, because of that, it actually forms a drug resistance TB and this is called as the evolution because now this is not going to be killed by this particular drug and this is exactly what is happening. Like right? once you are actually putting a challenge or once you are putting a challenge to a particular organisms, it will actually try to come up with the ways in which it will actually going to overcome that particular problem and that is the main basis of the evolution, right? that it has to, uh, you know, overcome, it has to acquire the additional traits. For example, the, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the primordial oceans, the primitive cells is formed, which is the unicellular cell, right? And then the unicellular cell uh, were having the deficiency because the unicellular cells cannot actually get the support from the neighboring cells because the name, it is actually a unicellular cell. So what he thought is that let's have a multicellular cell, right? If you go to the multicellular system, so in the multicellular system, the advantage is that first of all, you can actually do a division of labor. You can say, oh, you will do this, I will do this and all that. And on the other hand, even if the one cell is going to be under the threat or it is actually going to be die, the organism will still be able to survive because the organism is actually going to overcome that particular type of problems. Similarly, once the multicellular system, it actually could, you know, develop into the organ or organ system. And we know that the as you go uh, along the, you know, uh, this system, uh, you are actually acquiring more and more complexity and more and more complexity always comes up with the additional features. And that's why the people have, you know, observed that the uh, organism first appeared as a single unicellular organisms like the protozoa, right, amoeba. Then it goes into the multicellular stage where it has actually developed the sponges and uh, and uh, cylindrates and all those kind of hydra, right? For example, I, I think we have discussed all this when we were discussing about the classification, and that's why it is uh, these all these information came because we have classified the organisms and we understood why it is happening so, right? And then the these multicellular organisms develop into uh, you know a system where they can actually have the different types of organs, for example, the platyhelminthes. And then the platyhelminthes eventually developed into more advanced system where you don't have one single organ, but you have the organ system, like for example, the humans. So humans have the different types of organ system, like you have the liver, we have the kidney, we have the, you know, pancreas, we have the stomach, we have the different types of organ system. So every organ system is doing its job, but it also uh, trying to talk to its neighbor, right? Trying to talk its other organ system. For example, if you talk about the uh, digestions, uh, digestion is actually not happening because of the simple the elementary canal, right? A digestion is also happening because it is getting the support from the other organs like pancreas. It is getting the support from the liver. It is getting the support from the even the 
some more other you know system right so that's why you know so all these uh, so organ system is the most advanced system what is present in the organisms right so and that helps the the uh, the uh, you know that particular organism to uh, face the different types of the challenges so that is what it been considered by the aristotle and that's how he has prepared a ladder of chain so what you see here is a ladder of chain which actually been uh, evolved uh, which is been designed based on the who can do what right it's not been the same way in which the organism are being evolved this is based on the aristotle's understanding that okay this particular organism is you know having these kind of deficiency and uh, whereas these deficiencies are not present in the other organism so he has kept that particular organism into the lower level and he has kept the other organism for example he has kept the human on the top right because it believes that the humans have uh, oh, you know has all the uh, tools and tech, uh, you know all sort of systems so that he can actually be able to overcome all sort of problems right because so that's why he has kept the oh, humans on the top right whereas uh, he has kept the you know lower plants and all those kind of thing at the bottom right because they cannot do many of the things which higher plants or the organism could be able to do so so this is all about the the that you know chemical evolution and the, that okay there is a evolution happening but once you are talk about the science and when you say that evolution is happening you always looking for the experimental evidences and you are looking for the some sort of evidences to prove that there is a actually a system where is a through which the you know lower invertebrates develop into the higher uh, vertebrates and then higher vertebrates develop into the different types of animals like the uh, mammals and birds and snakes and all that right so what is the evidence what is the chemical evidence that the evolution is really happening so now the question is that what are the scientific evidences that the organisms are involved evolved from the previously existing organism which means whether there is a evolution or not right that we have to answer so if you study the physiology anatomy development of different organisms give the clues about the several similarities between the related organisms with the selected differences right so the correlation of the differences within the related organism has allowed to identify the properties used to study the evolutionary stages of an organism these evolutionary evidences are as follows right so if you study the physiology if you study the anatomy if you study the how the different organism have the different types of you know developmental stages and how they are actually been similar to the other organism but they still have their own peculiar features that all if you correlate it will actually going to give you a detail uh, you know it, it will actually going to give you that in the the relationship between the different organism and that's how you can be able to study or you can be able to understand the evolutionary stages of the an organism these evolutionary evidences could be classified into the three points right it can be either related to the morphology or the structural evidences it could be because of the embryological evidences or it could be because of the paleontological evidences which means where you are actually going to study the fossils right so fossils are also a very very good um, um, evidences that actually is going to prove that who came what time right Uh, within the morphological and structural evidences you can have the anatomy right you can have the uh, evidences which are actually going to say how the body is being organized then you can have the similarity within the physiology so you can have the homologous organs or you can have the analogous organs and then you can also be able to study how the physiology is been uh, modified uh, by the gradual uh, modifications so uh and then you can also be able to study the connecting links so connecting links are the organisms which are actually being connected between the two different organisms so they have the features which are common to the two different features so let's discuss each of these evidences and try to understand that how the scientists have come up with the idea that 
the evolution is really happening and there is a series or there is a event there is a scheme through which the uh, these organisms are evolving one scheme is anyway been proposed by the aristotle where he has you know proposed all the linking of all these organism and ladder of species he has proposed but that was not on the basis of the experimental evidences so let's first discuss about the morphological and structural evidences so as far as the morphological and structural evidence is concerned if you do the comparative study of the morphology which means and the anatomy of organism indicate that the few of the features are similar these are as follows right so if you try to see the morphological and structural evidences what you can see is you can be able to identify the similarities uh between the these features or you can be able to understand the differences right so if you go with the similarities and the differences what you can be able to understand how these organism could be uh, you know could be evolved the first is you can go with the body organizations the body organization of different organism is evolving over time with the different level of organizations the unicellular organizations with the single cells are the most primitive body organization followed by the cells to arrange to give rise to the tissue the tissue get, uh, gather to form the organs and the organ cooperate to form the organ system for example right so this is what we are talking about initially we have were having the unicellular organisms the unicellular organism then uh you know differentiated and they realized that okay we are actually been at the danger because as soon as we are actually getting any kind of you know scarcity for example if there will be a food shortage uh food shortage if there will be a food shortage for a unicellular organism he will die because there is no alternate source because he cannot but once it develops into a multicellular organisms or it can be developed into a tissue level organisms so what will happen tissue cell so here you have the single cell so you have one cell right suppose you have developed into a tissue level organizations and you have the 100 cells right and again you there will be a food shortage so what will happen the these 100 cells out of these 100 cells what will happen if suppose the 10 cell are going to die okay these 10 cells are actually going to die and they will be having the organic matter right this organic matter that organic matter is actually going to be utilized by the remaining 90 cells number 1 number 2 since it goes into a stage where it has the 100 cells Uh, and if there is a there is a threat coming like for example if there is a prey which is actually trying to kill them right you have the 100 people which are fighting so you can imagine that if you have single person fighting with the enemy it is difficult it is not possible to win but if you have the 100 people fighting with the same enemy could be there could be a possibility that you may be able to win because you can be able to you know fight with the full full strength right so you can be able to get protected number 1 number 3 that is the protection right even if the running the physiology also uh, if you have the 100 cells they these 100 cells could actually be able to do things more efficiently because you can be able to do a uh, yeah, exchange of material for example if if you have a single cell and you cannot be able to even uh, you know take care of the by products of the bio, of the uh, you know metabolism the by product is actually going to ultimately kill the unicellular cells right if you have the 100 cells uh, the by products could be scavenged by product could be scavenged by the other cells and because when you have the 100 cells some cells are actually going to be the new some cells are going to be old so these new cells are going to be more efficient in terms of performing the functions whereas the old cells are actually going to uh you know less efficient so these old cell will still survive because they are having a support of the new cells similarly when the tissue is going to develop into the organ the it is actually going to come up with the more and more sophistications because the organ is going to be more organized so it is going to have the different types of tissues and that's why there will be a further level of division of labor right and once the organ is going to develop into the organ system 
then you are actually going to have the support from the different organs right? so uh, that is actually going to you know uh, make the things more and more uh, you know systematic and sophisticated for example in the humans we have the different types of, for example in a single cell uh, is the single cell is performing all the functions whether it is the uh, respiration whether it is food intake whether it is the uh, you know taking care of byproducts whether it is the uh, water imbalance and so on whereas in the case of humans who have developed the organ system you have the you know you have the heart right you have the heart or the circulatory system which is actually going to take care of the circulation of the material or distribution then you have the lungs which is going to do the respiration uh, similarly you can have the liver you can have the kidneys and all those kind of things so these all these organ systems have their own dedicated functions but that does not mean that these organs are not going to talk to each other heart is always going to re listen to the you know brain and liver is also going to you know do coordination so there will be a coordination between the different organs and that's why it is going to have the organ system so that's why the organ system is the highest level of the organization which is present now let's see the example. So amoeba is unicellular, right? A sponge is multicellular or the tissue level organizations, but these cells are not organized into the tissue to exhibit the cellular level of organizations. Whereas in the case of cylindrate, like the hydra, cells are organized to form the tissue, but later do not form the organ. This is a tissue level organizations. Similarly, the in the platyhelminthes and higher animals, the different types of tissue give rise to the organ system of organizations. So, if you go with these kind of evidences where you have the body organization as a criteria, you understand that the probably the you know the unis the, probably the living or uni, unicellular organisms if, if appeared first then they will be developed into the tissue level organization then they develop into the organ and then they will develop into the organ system so if i go with this only this particular evidence i will say that the amoeba is being evolved into the sponges and then the sponges are being evolved into the cylindrates and then cylindrates are actually so cylindrate and the cylindrates are going to develop into the platyhelminthes and the platyhelminthes are actually going to develop into the higher vertebrates and then subsequently into the vertebrates same is actually also be true for the plant system like the plants uh, you have the unicellular plants like the algae then the algae is actually going to develop into the multicellular uh, uh, plants like the fungi then the fungi is going to develop into the bryophyta and then the bryophyta is actually going to develop into the pteridophyta and the pteridophyta is going to develop into the gymnosperm these are the you know the uh, the lower uh, plants and then the gymnosperm is going to develop into the angiosperm so so if you go by the body organizations you could get the clues and as well as the scheme through which the organisms are being evolved uh, from the pre existing in, uh, organisms so then we have the homologous organs a, that is another advance, uh, evidence the organs of the different species of a common descent which looks different and perform different functions but has the similar structures similar topographic origin and similar embryonic origin are called as the homologous origin organs homologous organ means the organism's anatomy is going to be identical but they are actually going to do the different functions okay so they will perform the different functions but their uh, our anatomy is going to be different uh, same right uh, we have couple of examples so homology is based on the divergent evolution so it will be actually be based on the divergent evolution right because because of the uh, adaptations so it this single organisms got evolved into these three organ but it's, it has he has not changed the anatomy he has only changed the way it, these organis, organs are going to be utilized uh, one of the classical example is the forelimb in the vertebrate animals so you have we have the forelimbs in the man cheetah whale and the bear and they are of different shape and perform different functions for example 
these are used for grasping objects so in the in, so this is these are the you know four up four examples you have the hand in the case of man then you have the cheetah right so you have the four limbs in the case of cheetah then you have the whale and then you have the bat and you know all these four organisms uh, four uh, vertebrate animals are different right for humans they are actually using the hand for holding the objects right so grasping the object whereas the same uh, for uh, for for limb is going to be used for running in the case of cheetah whereas in the case of whale that particular uh, four limbs is going to be converted into the uh, into the you know for uh, into the limbs right so swimming in the whale and the same is also been used for the flying in the bat in each case the structure of the forearm has similar plans like upper arm having the humerus followed by the radius and ulna and the hand with the carpals in the wrist so if you see the anatomy right is an anatomy remains the same right you have the humerus you have the radio ulna so you have the radio ulna uh, and then you have the hands right so here also you have the humerus you have the radio ulna and then you have the hands right but the functions are different functions are that in the case of human it is for holding the object whereas in the case of cheetah it is for running so it is been adopted accordingly right it is been adopted to give a uh, you know that particular type of functions whereas in the case of whale it is for the swimming and this bat this actually got the you know membrane so in this last part is actually getting the you know the membrane and because of that it got converted into a wing right and that's why it is being used for the uh, flying all vertebrates have the basic similarity in the structure of their four limb due to their origin from a common ancestral with the five digits so that's why these all these are, uh, organisms are, uh, all, all these animals are actually uh, you know been originated from the sim uh, single ancestor and that ancestor is actually a uh, having a pentadactyly features so pentadactyly means the organism which will actually going to have the five figures okay then we have another example so another example is the you have seen the thorn and the tendrils thorn is actually being used for the protection or in, in the plant right because it it protects the plant from the Uh, you know from the herbivores like for example the cow or buffalo uh, or uh, you know all these uh, you know grass eating plants like right? so they will be having the thorn so that when they try to eat these thorns are actually causing the injury and that's how they will be get protected whereas the tendrils are actually being used for the climbing right so they will be found in the uh, in the creepers and they will be used for the climbing so the the thorn in bougainvillea and the tendril in the passion flowers are the homologous organ in the plant because they are actually having the similar kind of you know anatomy except that here you have the you know pointed uh, knobs whereas in the case of this it got converted into a spiral spring like structures they look different and they helps in the plant in the climbing but both arise from the axillary position and are modified branches so these are actually been modified branches some one is used for the climbing the other one is used for the protection from the herbivores or protection from the cattle then we have the analogous organs the the an organs which perform same function and look similar but are quite different in their structure so this these analogous is very you know in uh, is is actually exactly opposite so they actually do the same function so they have the same function but they are different in terms of structure which means if you remember in the case of the homologous organ it was actually telling us the divergent Uh, uh evolutions whereas the analogous organs are going to tell us the convergent or uh, evolution which means these two are actually been converged uh, evolutions which, so if you see a uh, analogous organ it is actually going to tell you the convergent evolution because the structure is more 
you know important than the function because the function is very very you know can be based on the adaptation into that particular environment. So the example is there are several examples like for example the insects and the wing bird. So you have seen the wings in the butterfly right. So this is the butterfly and you might have seen the wing in the case of bird right. So both are actually the analogous argument because they both are being used for one function that is the flying right. They both are being used for the same function like the flying but their anatomy is different. You see the anatomy of the bird wings and the, you see the anatomy of the, uh, the flies right. So they are very different right. So the wings of the bird and the insects are the analogous organs. In both uh, organisms these organs are used to fly in air but they are different in terms of their structures. Insect wing is an extension of the integument integuments whereas the bird wing is a formed of the limb bones converted with the flesh skin and the feathers. So they are different in terms of their origin they are they, this is coming from the uh, integuments whereas this is actually a uh, is, is a extension of the forelimb right. So uh, where you have the feathers and all those kind of thing and that is how it actually get the ability to fly right. So it actually can be able to you know uh, 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 be able to change the air and that is how it actually be able to uh, you know uplift the birds. Then we have the uh, another example where you have the fin and the flippers. The pectoral fin of the fishes and the flippers of dolphins are flattened organ used for the swimming but both so here in this case we have the one function which is the swimming right. So uh, for swimming these two uh, these two fishes are actually using their fins and they have the fins and the flippers. So they are actually doing the same functions, but their anatomy is different. So but their structure is different. The flippers are the modified pentadactyly forelimb whereas fins are the pentadactyly. So the these two are actually being formed from the different origin and different structures but their function is same. So other evidence for the uh, in within the category of the morphological and structural evidence is the gradual modifications. In several cases the organs or the tissue exhibits the gradual modification during the course of the organic evolutions. For example, the heart. Heart is the classical example because heart was initially being two chambered right then that got converted into three chambered and then that got converted into four chambered. Within the two chambered you have the auricle and ventricle right. Within the three chambered you also have the auricle and ventricle and so on right. So you have see here if you have the two chambered it will be one auricle and one ventricle which is actually be present in the fishes. If you have three chambered it is actually two auricles and one ventricles which is actually been present in the amphibians and then there is a pseudo four chambered uh, uh, heart which is present which is having the two auricle and partly divided ventricles which is in the reptiles or the snakes and then you have the completely well developed four chambered heart in the case of the higher reptiles like crocodile birds and as well as the mammals. So between this you also have the four which is partially you know coated right. So this is what you said right this is this is actually going to be a intermediate stage right and this is the two chamber right. So this is having only two auricle and as well as the ventricle right and before this the there could be one chambered heart which was formed right which was the primitive heart probably be formed and uh, that got uh, you know split into two chambered and that's how the the you know so if you see like a uh, cockroach or lower invertebrates they don't have the heart but they have a pumping system and that is not having a chamber so this is not so there's no one chambered heart is present uh, in the any animal but the system what is present in the lower invertebrates are like they have a pumping system but that is not having a charge. 
right so you can imagine that two chambered heart right two chambered heart has auricle and ventricle now what is the disadvantage disadvantage is that it is actually not going to uh, avoid the mixing of the blood right you know that the uh, ventricle is actually having the pure blood whereas uh, auricle is having the pure blood whereas the ventricle is having the impure blood right so if you don't have the chambers you are actually going to mix these uh, uh, blood later on because the auricle is actually going to receive the uh, you know the pure blood from the from the lungs but uh, and then it is actually going to pump that blood into the body whereas so once you go from the two chamber to three chamber or three chamber to four chamber and uh, so on that is actually going, going to increase the efficiency of the working right you can be able to very precisely control uh, which chamber is going to accept the deoxygenated blood which chamber is going to give you the oxygenated blood and so on right and that's how you can avoid the mixing of the blood and that's how you can be able to uh, perform the functions properly so if you see the gradual modifications this is just a one example where we have taken an example of heart it actually says that initially the you know the fishes are being you know developed right so fishes then that fishes are actually given rise to amphibians then amphibians are being developed into the lower snakes right or the lower reptiles then the lower reptiles are going developed into the higher reptiles like higher reptiles where you have the crocodiles and all those kind of thing and then the higher reptiles got into the uh, into the you know ma the mammals or birds so so if you see all these evidences clearly says that the ladder of species what is being proposed by the aristotle was not completely correct right it was based on some assumption but here you see that if you see the letter of the species this is not a sequence in which it has been placed right it is it is being placed in a different sequence where the birds are you know placed lower to the reptiles then we have the another advantage the other example other advantage is the connecting links so what is the connecting link connecting links are the are so you have for example you have two any two three organisms right so you have organism one you have the organism two and you have the connecting links now this connecting link is actually going to diverge into these two species so it is actually going to have the mixture of properties what are being present so if this is suppose this is a this is b it is actually going to be a b so this during the course of you know this first of all this organism is being evolved right and then depending on the conditions depending upon the environment depending upon the uh, other kinds of you know adaptations this particular thing has given up the b so if there will be a uh, given up of the B character, it will develop into organism A. If there will be a giving up of the A, it is actually going to develop into the organism B. And that is how the connecting link is actually going to tell you that, okay, these A organisms and the B organisms are related to each other. They are actually going to have their common ancestors. You might have seen that kind of uh, common ancestor is also exist even within the different, uh, you know, different uh, races within the humans also, right? The living organism exhibit character of the two different groups of organism and known as the connecting links. There are few selected example of connecting links and few examples are as follows. Your example is a euglena. Euglena has the dual character of the plant and animal. So, Euglena is actually going to be a connecting link between the plants and the animal. And it is considered that the, probably the Euglena like molecules are being evolved, which was actually having the chloroplast at the uh, one side, and they also have the system so that they can be able to catch the prey. Uh, it can perform the photosynthesis through the specialized chloroplast. And it can perform the contractile vacuole, uh, mouth, and binary fusion 
and it can actually be able to eat just like the animal and that's why this is considered to be a connecting link between the plants and animals. Then we have an example two, which is a peripatus. So it is an example of connecting link between the arthropoda and the annelids. It has worm like body. So that is a character of unjoined lengths, which is similar to the arthropoda uh, annelids. Whereas it has claw, jaws, trachea and the dorsal tubular heart uh, as the arthropoda. So this is what I was talking about, dorsal tubular heart which was present in the cockroach and which is actually pumping the blood but that is a single chambered uh, organ uh, uh, the tissue and it does not have the you know well defined muscles and other things to pump but it is actually distributing uh, and it is considered to be heart like structure. Uh, so this is what right so peripatus is an example of connecting link between the arthropoda and anilida. Similarly you have the egg laying mammals you know that the mammals are actually giving rise to the uh, bird, uh, babies right but in this case we have the egg laying mammals so egg laying mammals are the connecting link between the reptiles and the mammals for example you have the duck billed platypus so this is a duck billed platypus they have a few mammalian characters such as hair mammary glands we have the diaphragms whereas it lay eggs with yolk and egg which is similar to the reptiles so if you, if you recall when we were talking about the classification of the living organism and we were talking about the features of the uh, mammalian system, we said that uh, there are seven characters which are which should be present onto the mammal. Like one of the character was the hair, the mammary glands and the, uh, the well developed the, the uh, respiratory system. So these are the three characters which were present in the duck bill platypus but they were also going to lay the eggs with yolk and Eggshell, which is similar to the reptiles. Then we have the several more examples also of the connecting links. For example, we have the neoplina, which is a connecting link between the annelids and the mollusk. Then we have the balanoglossus, which is a connecting link between the non chordate and the chordate. So I am not going to discuss about the multiple features. The only idea I was to just to give you that the connecting links are actually a very, very crucial. Uh, uh, evolutionary evidence that the two organisms actually been evolved from that particular uh, evo uh, particular organisms. Then you have a chimera, it is a link between the cartilaginous and the bony fishes. Then we have silencanth, which is actually a link between the bony fishes and the amphibians. And then you have spendon, which is a connecting link between the amphibians and the reptiles. So connecting links clearly highlight the fact that the different organisms are evolved together from a common ancestor and that is a very very strong evidence that the evolution is happening from the earlier primitive form of these organisms. Then we have the embryological evidences. So embryological evidences, the comparative study of the embryology of different organisms shows that the striking similarity between them. To explain this phenomena, the biogenetic law was proposed by the Ernest Haeckel. And what this law says? This law says, this law says that, that an organism, it's in individual developmental follow, in, in its individual development follow, the different developmental stages through which its ancestor have passed in the course of their evolution. What it means says is that if the man is the best organism which is as per the ladder of species from the Aristotle and if it suppose has the you know fishes, it has the snake, it has the amphibians like for example if all these are actually been uh, this the sequence in which it has followed. So when the baby is going to born, right, it is actually going to first be amphibians, then it is actually going to be the fish, and then it is actually going to be have it will show the features like a bird, and then it will eventually be developed into the man. So what it says, the what the Ernest Haeckel is saying is that the organism, it's an individual development follow the different developmental stages through which its ancestor have passed. So man has passed through multiple stages by which it has actually reached to this final stage. But when the baby is going to born, and that is what is exactly happened, right? When the fetus are born, they are actually swimming into the 
into the you know into the womb right into the that water and then that they will behave like a fish right and eventually they will develop like amphibians then fishes and then eventually they will develop into the man right so this is what example is what is showing here it will be showing the example of fishes salamanders tortoise chicken rabbits and the man so what you see here is initially it is actually going to have the fetus which is actually going to form uh, you know it look like as the amphibians and then it will actually going to develop into the fish like and then eventually it is actually going to form the uh, baby uh, in the case of man right so in another word the this law what it also says is that ontogeny repeats the phylogeny which means if you want to go with the deployment it is actually going to follow the phylogenetic tree right the phylogenetic means what are the different organism through which you have been evolved so let's take an example of the deployment of frog for example in its developmental stage it, it forms a fish like tadpole larva with tail then fin and gill for breathing in water it indicates that the frog is evolved from the fish like ancestors so that is a classical example where the tadpole or the frog is actually forming the species like so you know that the frog is for initially you know giving rise to the eggs then those eggs are being fertilized and these fertilized eggs are then going with the you know with the if they are swimming into the water like a fish and then eventually they will develop all the you know other kinds of appendages and other things and then they will develop into the frog then we have the paleontological evidences so what is the paleontology paleontology is the study of past life based on the fossil record the paleontology study the number and the nature fossil in the early rock distribution of the fossil in the successive strata now the question is what are the fossil and how it is formed and provide the information about the evolution the fossils are the remain or the impression of the ancestral organism preserved by the natural mean in some medium for example this is a fossil of insects into the amber right so the medium found with the fossils are like sedimentary rocks it could be amber it could be asphalt it could be volcanic ashen ash ice peat bogs sand and the muds what is the mechanism of the fossil formation so during the formation of the sedimentary rock the dead animal of the sea or the large lakes and the land carried out to the sea or large by the river sink down and get buried into the rock so when there will be a rock is forming so for example this is the rock right and it is accumulating the soil right so it could possible that one you know one dead animal is going to fall and then it is actually going to again covered with that particular uh soil soil particle and because of that it is actually and since there will be no entry of oxygen this particular organism is going to be preserved supply of oxygen is limited in this condition and prevent the decay or reduce the decay rate to minimal so because it will not allow the decaying at a, at a faster rate compared to what we could see in the uh in the you know in the uh, in the open it is actually going to give you a impression so when you take out it is actually going to give you a impression of that particular uh, animal or and if you take out that soil it will actually going to give you the molds right so as a result the animal remains preserved in the rock and have the have formed the fossils the hard remained of the dead got preserved layer by layer in the sedimentary rocks the fossil present in the deeper layers are earlier and the upper layer had more recent rocks there are several different kinds of fossil the fossils are distributed in amber asphalt ice volcanic ash pet box storm dust and the sand dunes so this is the table where i have shown all different types of fossils their formation and examples for example there are fossil where the entire organism is being preserved the example is the woolly mammoth in the siberia insects exoskeleton mummies of the mammals and birds found in the california and the giant alloc of ireland so these are the different skeleton like the other example is the skeleton material so in this case you cannot develop you cannot have the uh, entire organisms but you can have the some part like the bones teeth shells and all those kind of things
then you have the molds and the cast so here you will not get even the skeleton or the entire organism but you will going to have the negative impression so in this the hard part trapped in the sediment and that hardened to rock skeleton dissolve leaving its impression as the mold right so this is a gastropods from the poland so that is a example of the fossil and this is what is uh, other examples of the fossils what is been present so how we, the question is how you can determine the age of the fossil the age of the fossil can be determined by the following method so in the past people were using the relative dating methods so in the early dates the mechanism of absolute dating was not present and as a result the relative dating technique were used to determine the age of rock and the fossil in this technique the position and the erosion rate of rock in particular environment the older rocks are situated in deeper had ancient fossils and superficial rock had the fossil of the recent fossil so this relative dating technique is very uh, you know is like you say that you know if you have a rock right and if you find the fossil here if you find the fossil here since this is actually in a deeper portion and this is a shallow portion this is going to be earlier fossil this is going to be the late fossil but this is all based on the relativity this is going to be a relative so that's why the people were looking for the absolute dating method and they have developed the multiple absolute dating method these methods are using the spontaneous decay of unstable radioactive nuclei into the stable radioactive nuclei at a constant and known rate absolute dating technique uses the radioactive nuclei in three different techniques so you have the uranium lead technique so this is the uranium uh, decay what has been shown so if you see the very clearly the in the uranium lead te technique this technique was introduced by the baltwood in 1907 so rock contains the uranium which is the uranium 238 in the form of mineral zir zircon so uranium decay spontaneously to lead as per the given scheme so you have the uranium 238 then it will going to form the thoronium 234 then it is going to form the protonium and so on and ultimately what you are going to form is you are going to form the lead so depending on the amount of lead depending upon the amount of uranium you can be able to identify how many life cycle how many half lives are been uh, you know crossed right for example if one half life the uranium is going to develop into thoronium but the dif difference is the 4.5 into 10 to the power 4 years so if you count the number of half lives you can be able to count the uh, the uh, the age of that particular fossil so it has a half life of 4.5 billion year which means it will take Uh, this many years to decay 50% uranium so determine determination of the content of uranium and the lead in a rock or fossil can be used to determine the age of rock for example if i got uh, like uh, 40% right or if i got the 50% decay so suppose i got the total amount and suppose i got uh, 10 mg of uranium and 10 mg of lead right that means that there is a 50% decay and that means that the age of that particular fossil or date age of age of that particular rock is 4.5 billion years right you can easily calculate accordingly the same way right if you got like for example if you got 2 mg of uranium and you got 8 mg of lead then also you can be able to calculate right you can be able to calculate so there will be 80% decay right so that's how you can be able to calculate the age of that particular rock using these kind of equations then we have the carbon dating method so carbon method is also been introduced by the wf libby in 1950 the radioactive carbon c14 is found naturally in rock and c14 has a half life of 5600 years and c14 decay gives rise to the nitrogen 14 carbon dating method can be used to measure the fossil range fossil age up to the 25 years age so you can see that you have the uranium method you have the carbon method and you have the potassium method and all these methods are actually having the multiple range in which you can be able to use 
Then we have the potassium argon method. So radioactive potassium is easily found in the rock of all night. It has a life, half life of 13.9 years and it is disintegrated to form the organ. So the, you can actually be able to use all these three methods to calculate absolutely. There will be no relative dating method. So these are absolute methods. It will actually going to tell you what is the age. Age is 10, 20, whatever, right? And that's how you can be able to correlate the different fossils what is being found even in the different areas or different region within the world. Now, utilizing what is the what is the utility of you know determining the age of the fossil? That they, if you determine the age of the fossil, you can be able to utilize that information to calculate when that particular organism is being appeared. And based on this, the people have come up with the geographical scale or geographical time scale, right? Geological time scale is actually going to tell you the appearances of the different uh, uh, animals and so use of the radioactive dating method has allowed the determination of fossils found in the different sedimentary rock sample. It has allowed to calculate the presence of different organisms preserved in the rock sample in the form of fossil. In addition, it helps the scientists to predict uh, that the earth is approximately 4.5 billion year old and life appeared on earth almost 400 billion years ago. So these two information actually came because of the carbon dating or the absolute dating techniques. Since then the earth's history has been divided into five different time frames known as the eras. Few of these eras are divided into periods and which turn in split into the epochs. The different eras are as follows. So you have the Archezoic era. So that Archezoic era is starting from the 4600 to 3500 million years. Remember that it is always been done in the reverse order, right? You see the higher number and then you see the lower number, right? So this means we are talking about from the, uh, from the reverse, right? So it is the first era and begun with the formation of earth and presence of the solar system. There is no fossil form available during this era. This means this is the era when the earth is actually being formed. Then we have the Proteozoic era which is starting from the 3000 to 1000 million years. It is the second era and began with the origin of the prokaryotes, the primitive metazoans and the eukaryotes. Reports are available about the scanty uh, fossils in this era. Then we have the Paleozoic era which starts from the 570 to 280 million years. See, there is, a, there is a gap actually and these gaps actually, since there are no fossil found between this and this age, we cannot have any idea what is happening. So it is the third era and known as the era of ancient life. It saw the appearance of invertebrates, fishes, amphibians and reports of spore bearing animal plants like which means uh, trees, ferns and origin of conifers is available. Initial reports are also available about the scanty fossils in this particular era. Then we have the Mesozoic era so, and the Mesozoic era is from the 225 to 135 million era. This appearance of the tooth birds, right, uh, therian animals, reptiles and the dominance of dinosaurs. In addition, the placental mammals are also found. The reports of cycads uh, uh, and the flowering plant is also available. And then you have the Cenozoic era or the modern era where which is uh, starting from the 135 million years. This is the modern era and it witnessed the dominance of present age man, modern mammals, birds, fishes and insects. So this is what we have discussed so far. What we have discussed, we have discussed about the evolutions, we have discussed about what are the different evidences, what we have produced for uh, uh, which actually support that there is the evolutions. So we have discussed about the morphological and structural evidences, we discuss about how the body organization is giving you the idea about the 
how the different organisms are evolving from the pre-existing environment like you have initially you have the cellular level organizations then you are having the tissue level organizations and then you are having the organ or the organ system organizations and you know and we have discussed also the many advantage as well as the disadvantage of these systems. Then we have also talked about the homologous as well as the analogous organs and we have said that the homologous organs is actually going to give you the idea about the diverge evolutions whereas the analogous organs is going to give you the evolution about the converge evolutions. So if you could uh, study the homologous as well as the analogous organs, you can be able to make the very clear and crystal pictures who appeared when, right? And then we also talk about the gradual modification, how the different organisms or different organisms have adopted to the change environment and because of that they have changed the physiology, they have changed the organs. We have taken an example of heart and we have discussed about how the heart is being converted from the two chamber to the four chamber. And then we also discuss about the connecting links and connecting link is a very, very crucial uh, uh, features or crucial uh, evidence that proves that the, these two organisms are coming from the, that particular ancestor uh, uh, connecting links. And then we also discuss about the embryological evidences as well as the paleontological evidences. And at the end, we have also discussed about the different uh, eras in which uh, through which the, the it has been the, the, we have also discussed about the geological time scales and we have discussed about the uh, different types of eras what are present. So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. In the subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss about the how the evolution is happening. So till then, goodbye. Thank you.